Before we start going through the tables in the paper Replicating Anomalies, I would like to discuss the issue of uh, statistical significance of the risk premiums. So we stopped the derivation on the whiteboard with this formula, what, the, what you see here, where, where our estimated lambda, yeah, denoted as lambda hat, yeah, we um, have regressed in this equation the uh, vector of expected returns on our matrix x lambda. Yeah. What we get is a two by one vector, which you see here in the, in the next uh, equation, where our risk premium that we are interested in, that is associated in our case, in our example, with the cumulative fast returns, uh, as long as we deal with the momentum anomaly. So we're interested in this lambda hat one, yeah, which basically gives gives us an estimate or uh, an estimate of the average risk premium that is related to the cumulative past returns yeah, in our example. So here we finished our uh, derivation on the whiteboard. So we get this two by one vector, and it's basically it gives us a point estimate. Yeah? This is just a point estimate. And if this guy here is, is larger than zero, we know that the risk premium, that uh, the cumulative returns are related, or that, that, that they bear basically a risk, pre uh, risk premium, that they are related to a risk premium. So the question that arises, is this risk premium here significant? Yeah, this is something that we have not covered on the whiteboard, but this is what we want to discuss now. So how do we proceed in order to get the t-statistic? There are, of course, many different uh, ways how to do that. This is just one possibility that we uh, will discuss now. So we can stack our excess returns of our stocks. Yeah, you, you might remember we have n stocks in our sample and t time series observations. So we can stack them into a t by n matrix. This T by N matrix has in the first column uh, the excess returns of the first stock across time from T is equal to one until T is equal to capital T. So this is a T, T by one vector, what you see here in the, in the first column here, T by one vector, the excess returns of the first stock in our, of our sample across time. So, we have obviously n columns here. Yeah? The last column here in our matrix contains the excess returns of stock of our last stock, capital N, again across time from T is one until T is capital capital T. Yeah. So, so how to do in order to get the T statistics? So first of all. What we want to do is our our goal is we want to store for all of our n assets the corresponding estimated uh, risk premium. Yeah, the second guy here, lambda hat one. So what what we do is first of all we grab the first column vector. Yeah, so we have obviously capital N iterations. So for each single stock, we, we grab from our matrix here the corresponding vector i. Uh, we start with i is equal to one. Then we grab the first guy here, yeah, which is which you see uh, here. This is this is our first column. So if this is if i is equal to one, yeah, we, we get the first the, the next return vector of the first stock across time. Yeah. What we do then is we just multiply this guy here from, from the right with this matrix here that we have already defined earlier. This is the same matrix as here. It's the same guy that we ha have already derived. Yeah. So this, that's constant in all iterations across N, and across capital N. The only thing that changes is obviously what we here multiply on the right-hand side. This guy here, as we as we define it as the expectation um, across 
these n assets. But now we take each single asset here, obviously. So we multiply this guy here with the time series vector for each single asset. Uh, so what we get is a two by one vector. If we multiply this out, we, we will get a two by one vector that contains the corresponding risk premium yeah, here. This guy is, is the important one, the second one. The, the corresponding risk premium for the first asset. Yeah. We stack it into a row vector here, and we continue. We do the next iteration. We do the same thing again, but now i changes to 2. Now we take the second guy out of this matrix, which, is, which are the, the, the exact returns across time of our second stock. And we do the same thing again. We regress this, this vector on this matrix here. Lambda, uh, x lambda yeah, of, on this matrix product here. It's basically the formula for uh, OLS estimation, right? So what we get then is in the second iteration, we get again the corresponding risk premium that is related for the, or that is, that is associated with the second stock of our sample. Again, we, we, we grab this guy off the vector and store it here in the, in the uh, row vector, in the row vector. We do this capital N times, okay? Until we reach here the last column vector of our matrix, yeah? This is when E is equal to capital N. So in our last iteration, obviously, we regress the excess returns of our last stock uh, across time on this matrix product here. What we get is, again, we get the corresponding risk premium yeah, for the last stock here. What we can do then do is we get simply this is simply a row vector, or we can also transpose it. Okay, it, it doesn't matter. It is a row row vector or a, a vector of, of risk premiums. So the only thing that we need to do is we have to estimate the sample average, which is the same thing as we get here, because it's basically this is basically the uh, um, sample average of this guy here. Okay, this one can show that these are equivalent. So if you take the the average from this row vector here or column vector, it is it it must be the same value as what we get here in this uh, um, average basically formula for getting the average risk premium. So then we divide it simply by the standard deviation. So we have to compound the t statistic of this cross-sectional vector here. And if the t-statistic indicates, or if the t-statistic uh, has a higher value than 1.96, it would indicate that the risk premium um, is significant on a 5% significance level. Okay? So that's basically how we would proceed. Or that is just one possibility how to proceed. There are also other possibilities, okay? So the problem, obviously, in this in this estimation is that we use here in this step estimates, okay? So in our X matrix, you remember, we have these estimated beaters from the uh, first step, yeah? So, so cross-sectional regressions are obviously two-step procedures. So here, our X matrix contains estimates yeah, so that's basically a problem. So, and we have somehow to correct for that. Yeah. And this procedure here actually does not take this into account. So, that, so there are different procedures how to deal with this issue. And uh, one way is certainly resampling, uh, bootstrapping. There are also other procedures possible. So, if you study the literature carefully, you will probably um, read about the Shunken correction. Yeah, which basically accounts for this issue or addresses this, this issue. But as for now, this is uh, one possibility, and there are some, per some papers circulating around that basically use this sort of method. Okay, now we uh, go to our paper that we would like to discuss here in this lecture, Replicating Anomalies. It's written from Hu, Xu, and Xang. Yeah? published in 2018 in the Review of Financial Studies. Now, the Review of, of Financial Studies is one of the top three finance journals. And of course, I would recommend you 
when you start to write your master thesis that you also focus your your own research or that you relate your own research to what is published in these top three journals. You know, the Journal of Finance, the Review of Financial Studies, or the Journal of Financial Economics. So all papers that I cover in this lecture, obviously, are very recent. They are published in the last two years. Yeah? So the first paper that we discussed last time is published in 2018 in the Journal of Financial Economics, which is also top three journal. This study here is published in 2018 as well. And the forthcoming studies that we cover here in this course are published in 2020, so this year. So very current research. And uh, yeah, the, the goal is, of course, or my objective is, of course, that you um, are familiar with up-to-date research. So the major finding in this paper here is that using a t-value, of 1.96, yeah, they find out or they figure out that 65%, so the vast majority of anomalies, of replicated anomalies, fail replication. Yeah. They write it already here in the first sentence. Most anomalies fail to hold up the currently acceptable standards for empirical finance. Yeah. If they impose the higher t statistic, yeah, we discussed this on the whiteboard, the multiple test hurdle of 2.78 yeah, as a 5% significance level instead of this 1.96. The failure rate is even higher. Yeah? So 82% of these 452 anomalies fail replication when using this multiple test hurdle of 2.78. Which, which is shocking news at some point, right? So we discussed most issues already here. Let's go directly to section 2.2 in this paper, where it becomes uh, interesting. So in, or in section 2.1, actually it starts. So in section 2.1 and in section 2.2, they basically uh, describe how they proceed. Yeah, you, you will hear about uh, NYSE breakpoints. They talk a lot about NYSE breakpoints um, as opposed to NYSE, AMEX, and NASDAQ breakpoints. So what's the difference? So basically, um, obviously, this is a different stock universe. NYSE stocks, ob uh, obviously, um, are, they basically, um, here, they contain. They also contain in, in this sample here or in, in this population. But these stocks here also include Amex and Nasdaq, Nasdaq stocks. Moreover, if you use uh, breakpoints, this is NYSE, Amex, and Nasdaq breakpoints. You obviously have. Um, you would allocate uh, or your your breakpoint for what you denote as micro caps is uh, lower as it is here in NYSE breakpoints, because obviously you have uh, only a subsample of stocks in your NYSE stocks, and they are probably bigger uh, than the stocks contained uh, in this stock universe, containing also that also accounts for Amex and Nasdaq stocks. So the basically how you treat micro caps in the sample, or how you mm, what what stocks you refer to as micro caps, is different if you use. Uh, NY, if, if you use all stocks here, or if you just use NYSE breakpoints. So that's that's basically the difference. Also, we also discussed during the uh, whiteboard derivations, differences between equal weighted and value weighted portfolios. Yeah. So also, um, we talked also about this cross-sectional regressions comes very intensively um, using like uh, value the, the weighting matrix in between. Yeah? So it's they, they call it here pharma Macbeth or uh, cross-sectional regressions uh, value weighted least squares, using value weighted least squares. Yeah? And uh, the reason for why they do that is that it, they, they argue that it mitigates the, the impact of outliers. Yeah? And uh, it, it gives by this more robust estimates. And it also, of course, uh, accounts for the fact that uh, we have obviously, um, as reported in other papers, um, anomalies are stronger when implemented among small stocks, 
but using uh, value-weighted returns, obviously small stocks get a lower weight in the estimation procedure than big stocks, and so this also accounts for the uh, small stock problem. Yeah? So that's the reason for why they use this uh, value-weighted least squ squares method when implementing cross-sectional regressions. So in section in section uh, two one, they also discuss the the methodology that we derived uh, on the whiteboard. Yeah, and in section two two entitled re reliable procedures that control for microcaps they argue basically that in contrast to, to other papers they explicitly uh, take uh, microcaps also into account in their sample yeah? so so they do not exclude microcaps they also argue that uh, microcaps are influential in, in equal weighted returns yeah? and uh, on average only three percent of the aggregate market capitalization of the nyse amex and nasdaq universe um, they account basically for for 60 percent of the stocks but only for three percent of the market cap yeah? so that's also an interesting thing to take into account so let's jump directly to table one here in this paper. This is the first interesting table for us. So what we what we learn here from this table, yeah, the, the overall market that, that they consider consists of 3,896 firms on average yeah, across time. Yeah? And it, the sample runs obviously from 1967 until December 2016. From this average 3,896 firms, 2,365 firms are, are so-called microcaps, yeah? whereas 765 are on average big stocks yeah? from this 3,896. Of course, the overall market cap of all these 3,896 stocks is 100%. It must be like that. But on average, 3.21% is the market cap of these micro stocks, yeah, these this very, very small stocks. Whereas 90%, more, slightly more than 90% of the market cap falls on big stocks. Yeah, we see already here yeah, that there's some, some, something strange going on here. So the majority of, of stocks, yeah, the majority of number of stocks as only a very small fraction of the overall market cap. That's the first important thing to know. What we see here is if we consider value weighted returns, so the average of the whole market return value weighted is 0 0.91. If we take the equal weighted average, we have 1.17. So it's obviously higher always when you use equal weighted returns the average market return will, will be higher. Why? Because small stocks or micro caps will receive the same weight as big stocks. Yeah? So it's so sort of biased. The uh, value-weighted returns for big stocks is close to the, to, to the value-weighted market return. So it's 0 0.90, yeah? so 90 basis points on average per month. What we see also here in the last column, cross-sectional standard deviation of returns, we see that the cross-sectional standard deviation of returns is for the big stocks portfolio, yeah, the lowest. So big stocks have the lowest cross-sectional standard deviation of returns on average, whereas micro stocks have the highest cross-sectional standard deviations of return. Yeah? It's more than twice as much. What does that mean? So it means that big stocks obviously move more in the same direction as micro stocks. Micro stocks have, have much more uncertainty. Okay. So it's, it's more likely 
that micro stocks move in different directions than big stocks do. If we now scroll down, yeah, we see that the figure one entitled time series properties of micro caps. Yeah. So again, the sample is the same from 1967 until 2016, covering 600 months. So what we see here is the evolution of uh, microcaps across time. So you see here that in 1987, here in, or in the in the in the mid mid 80s, we had the highest percentage, about 70 uh, percent uh, of of all firms were microcaps uh, in the mid 80s. So 70 percent of the stock universe in the US have been microcaps. And then we see a downwards trend here. Yeah? So in the um, end of the sample period, so in 2016, obviously, it's roughly, it's around 50% of the stocks are microcaps. Yeah, 50% of the whole uh, stock universe. So we see here a clear tendency. Yeah? So firms, uh, we have less firms that are microcaps in our sample across time. What we also see here is that from uh, figure uh, panel B here in figure one, we see that in, uh, in 2016, about 2% uh, here, about 2%, or it's roughly below 2% actually, of the market capitalization is uh, or belongs to the micro micro cap category yeah? whereas here in the mid 80s we had six percent of the overall market cap was falling on on micro caps also here we see a, a trend right a downwards moving moving trend so less and less of the overall market capitalization goes to micro caps what we see here in the uh, last panel, panel C in figure one, we see that the average market capitalization of microcaps increases over time. Yeah? So for instance, here in the end of the sample in 2016, roughly the, the average uh, firm size of a microcap company was $0.5 billion. Uh, we see here $0.5 billion. Whereas here in the mid 80s, it was much, much lower. Yeah. It probably around 0 0.1. So it has uh, dramatically increased. So again, for summarizing, microcaps become bigger across time. We have across time less and less microcaps. And the amount of market cap. Um, from the overall market uh, market capitalization becomes less and less, which implies in turn that bigger firms become even more bigger. Yeah. If we now move on to table two, which is the next interesting table here of this paper, let's. I will open in another document where I have highlighted the uh, articles and made some notes on it. Let's go to table two here, which we see here. Yeah, I copied it differently so that it's easier to read. So table two is entitled portfolio weights on micro caps and investment capacity. Sample period is of course the same. What we see here is when using NYSE stocks and equal weighted returns, and we consider now the uh, long leg and the short leg of our different um, anomaly categories. Yeah? Remember now that on the high side here, this is our long leg, okay, and momentum. Uh, basically refers to the whole um, anomaly category momentum, and there are many different anomalies in this category. Yeah, we spoke about this uh, earlier in the lecture. Yeah, they divided the whole um, 
the, the whole universe of anomalies into six different categories. Yeah. And uh, here on the right hand side, we see the, the uh, long leg, so what, what, what we are investing in, and low refers to the short leg, how we finance it. Yeah. Okay. So this is basically our short position. And here on the right hand side, this is our long position. And if we consider only the category momentum for a second, so what we see is that using value weight, so using uh, equal weighted returns uh, and NYSE stocks, we see that 46.66 um, or 47.66 percent are allocated to micro caps. And 55.6, 55.24% fall on uh, micro caps in the uh, short leg of our strategy. So obviously, if we use equal weighted uh, returns, we uh, the, the majority is invested in in uh, micro caps, which which also of course, confirms earlier research stating that uh, anomalies are stronger um, across uh, when implemented among small stocks. Yeah. If we use value-weighted returns, obviously the uh, amount here uh, decreases yeah, from 47.66 to 3.87 in the long leg. And from 55 point, uh, sorry, 62.23 to 8% in the short leg. Now we have to consider, if you consider momentum, we have to consider these uh, two figures here. Yeah. And for uh, all anomalies together, yeah, using NYSE stocks and equal weighted returns, we would invest 59.53% in micro caps. And uh, in the long leg, and 55.24% in micro caps in the short leg. Whereas using value weighted returns and NYSE stocks, we would invest uh, roughly 10% into micro caps uh, with respect to the long leg, and 7.19% when we consider the short leg. Now, that's basically what we learn from. Table two. Of course, in section two, three, three limitations, they argue okay. Um, they they want to clarify that micro caps play an important role in the real economy. Uh, so a, a large fraction of aggregate employment resides in micro caps. So in, for, for example, firms with less and 50 employees contribute to more than 30% of the total employment. So here, basically, they just want to highlight that uh, microcaps are not unimportant from an economic perspective. Yeah? But obviously, from a financial perspective, people are uh, focused more on uh, big stocks. Again, in section three, they basically um, highlight one more time how they proceed. Yeah? So they use the standard t statistic of 1.96 in the replication procedure as a 5% threshold, and also uh, the uh, higher value of 2.78 yeah, for uh, the multiple testing hurdle that we all discussed already. So in Figure two, which is our next interesting figure. Here we can see it's uh, the table or the figure description is replication rates as a percentage, single and multiple tests. Again, same sample period. So what we see here from from this table using NYSE stocks and value weighted returns and 1.96. So the standard T statistic, only 17.9% 
can be replicated. Also, uh, yeah, when, when using basically, uh, sorry, when using the multiple test hurdles, so 2.78, 17.9% can be replicated when using NYSE stocks and evaluated returns. So in general, they, they argue, okay, if we can replicate, if we could replicate 80 success, 80%, 80 it's a success. So the, they argue the replication holds whenever we can replicate 80%. So obviously, 79% is less than 80%. So the replication fails when using the multiple test hurdle, the test statistic of 2.78. Using a single test, so basically if we take 1.96 as the corresponding T statistic, 35% of the anomalies can be replicated in the universe NYSE stocks and evaluated returns. This is basically what the figure is, is telling us here. If we use NYSE stocks and equal weighted returns and the T statistic of 1.96, then we see that 50, what is it, 56.4% of the anomalies can be replicated. If we use the T statistic of 2.78, uh, but we account for a multiple testing hurdle and uh, we use NYSE stocks and equal weighted returns, only 46.7% can be replicated. So obviously, when we consider these uh, numbers here, irrespective if whether we use multiple tests hurdle of or the the, the t statistic cutoff of 2.78, or if we use the lower um, cutoff of 1.96, the standard t statistic, all of these replications fail when we consider the 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 uh, stock universe. And now in 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 in, in figure R, ah, these are the numbers for the extended sample. Yeah? But if we now move to, to, uh, to the right-hand side and check figure B, yeah, here we, they implement the same for the original sample for, for each of these uh, studies, we see the same thing. Yeah? The same, there's, it's, it's almost the same numbers here. So it doesn't matter. So it doesn't obviously, it does not depend on the sample. Because irrespective of whether they use the original sample or the extended sample, the replication fails. Because much less than 80% of the, of the anomalies can be replicated. And here, all, we, we remember, all stocks are obviously NYSE, AMX, and NASDAQ stocks. Yeah? Uh, and it's, it's the same picture here, basically. Yeah? Using... Uh, all stocks and evaluated returns and a uh, single test hurdle of 1.96. Obviously, 40.7% of uh, the anomalies can be replicated in this stock universe and using this methodology, whereas using a multiple test hurdle of 2.78 yeah, as corresponding T-statistic, only 22.1% can be replicated. Yeah. And the same is true uh, the, the same conclusion for the original sample. Yeah. So overall, yeah, that's the big picture here. Yeah. Basically, in Figure One, we uh, consider all anomalies. Yeah. So all these numbers here are for all anomalies. So what we see is, if eighty percent is a success, then obviously all using basically the 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 uh, Having the big picture in mind, anomalies fail replication. Yeah, that's the that's the general conclusion of uh, Figure Two. If we now move further to Figure Three, what they do in Figure Three is they basically they break down Figure Two in their six uh, in the six different categories of anomalies. Yeah, we, we see here, panel A is momentum anomaly, and we have 57 anomalies in, in this category. Panel B, they report the uh, corresponding figures for the value versus growth anomaly, 
And here we have 69 different uh, anomalies, obviously, that fall into this category. Panel C is the investment anomaly. Here we have 38 different anomalies that fall into this category. Panel D is the profitability anomaly. Here we have 79 anomalies that fall into this category. Panel E is denoted as intangible category. Here we have 103 anomalies. And the last um, panel, panel F, is denoted as trading frictions. And here we have 106 anomalies that fall into this category. Yeah. Let's go back to the uh, original paper because I think that's better to read this table. Let's move to table uh, to figure three here. Where do we find it? Here we have it. Now the, you can see the figures much clearer. So if you check the momentum anomaly here in uh, panel A, yeah. Here we have the corresponding figures for momentum. Impl impl implementing mo uh, the momentum anomalies, yeah, we have, was it 58? 57. Implementing 57 anomalies using NYSE stocks and value-weighted returns, yeah, we see that 63.2% of, the, of these 57 anomalies can be replicated using, or they, these basically, um, they are significant using a 1.96 uh, value as uh, corresponding value for 5% significance level. Using a value of 2.78 as hurdle for significance, we see that 49.1% of these 57 anomalies can be replicated in this universe of NYSE stocks and, and using value-weighted returns. This is basically how, you, how we would interpret or how we would read these uh, figures here in the first row of uh, figure A. If we now, uh, if we use equal-weighted returns, however, and if we implement the momentum anomalies, our 57 anomalies in our NYSE universe, we see that we can that 84.2% 80, can be replicated if we use, uh, if we basically would uh, use the value of 1.96 as, as our value indicating significance, we see that 84.2% of our 57 um, anomalies have higher T statistics than 1.96. 77.2% of our 57 anomalies have a higher tier statistic of 2.78. Okay, so these numbers say this is clearly above 80 percent, this is close to 80 percent. Yeah? So here we can say, okay, obviously, momentum does not fail the uh, replication. Yeah? Obviously, if we uh, use value added returns. And implement uh, our 57 momentum strategies using NYSE stocks. We see that obviously 84, slightly more than 84 percent of our 57 anomalies have higher T statistics than 1.96. And the same is true actually if we use uh, all stocks, that is NYSE, IMX, and Nasdaq stocks. Again, using equal weighted returns, yeah, we see that using a cut off or a tier statistic um, or the, the, the cut off of the tier statistic of 1.96 indicating significance, we see that 84.2% of our 57 anomalies generate uh, corresponding tier statistics that exceed the level of 1.96. Yeah? So again, if we, con if we consider uh, equal weighted returns and in, in both stock universes and NY, using NYSE stocks and or all stocks, momentum uh, does not fail uh, the replication. But this is basically what we learn from panel A here. In panel B, we remember this is value versus growth. Yeah, we see the numbers are slightly worse. Yeah, we see here uh, the maximum number of uh, replication is 78%. For both NYSE stocks 
and uh, all stocks using equal weighted returns, we see for category C, category C, if we move, scroll down, is investment, obviously, yeah, the investment category. We have 38 anomalies here in this category. So we see if we use NYSE e stocks and equal weighted returns, yeah, and we employ the uh, hurdle of 1.96, as a corresponding t statistic, we see that out of these 38 cat, um, different anomalies, 97.4% generate higher t statistics than 1.96, whereas 94.7% of these 38 anomalies have higher t statistic, have higher t statistics than 2.78. Yeah. So obviously, this investment category can be replicated very well. Yeah, this is what we learned from this table. If we move down, the uh, worst performing is obviously category F, and this was the category trading frictions. Yeah, here we have 106 anomalies in this uh, anomaly category, and we see here scientific replication fails. Yeah? So it's obviously none of these, uh, irrespective of which stock universe we consider or irrespective of which method we consider we end up we end up always with lower replication uh, success than than 80 percent yeah so this is basically what we learn from from this table so if we break down this table two yeah now we can basically now we have a, a better view for uh, what's the reason for the failure of uh, of a replication so the reason is that obviously we have here certain categories that perform very poorly yeah? especially category d e and f yeah but the worst obviously is the category uh, trading frictions so next we change again to the uh, paper where i highlighted uh, figures again because of the readability we go now to table three. Obviously, we cannot cover all anomalies, but we will just pick some of them. Because now we go basically, uh, they go through 452 different anomalies and uh, step, step by step. So they break down basically now table uh, figure three into their components. Okay. If you just have a look, for instance, let's have a look on, on, on price momentum, okay? So we, we, we know already that the momentum category performs pretty well. So what we see from this table here is that the uh, here in the in the first column where, where we have this, this is our bar, this is basically the average return, and here we see uh, what what are the inputs? Okay, here we use NYSE stocks. Here we have and uh, NYSE breakpoints. Here we have um, Nasdaq, Amex, and NYSE together. So what we see here is basically that momentum using uh, the prior six months return as sorting uh, characteristic and keeping this return for one month yeah, generates 60 uh, basis points or 0.6% per month payoff. Now, the corresponding T statistic is here 2.08. Yeah. If you consider the uh, six months holding period, which we see in the row below, the payoff is slightly higher. It's 0.82% per month or 82 basis points. And the T statistic is 3.50. Uh, which is clearly higher than both 1.96 or 2.78. Yeah. So also here, if we go to the next row, if we consider a 12 months holding period yeah, and prior six months return as a sorting characteristic, we see the payoff is 0.55% per month with a statistic of 2.91, which is also higher than both. 1.96, or if we use the higher T statistic accounting for the multiple testing hurdle of 2.78. Yeah? So we see momentum appears to be robust. And also, if we 
go to equal weighted returns or here all value weighted returns we see for instance for uh, the six months holding period similar pattern yeah t statistic is 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 high 2.90 here 4.63 here we have 6.2.63 uh, so momentum seems to be a robust uh, anomaly so it's a, it's possible to replicate momentum And this is also what they write here in, in the paper, if we sc scroll down. Let me just go to the corresponding description on page 19. Let me see. Yeah, here you see on page 19, the author state price momentum fares well in our, in our replication. In particular, the high minus low decile on the prior six month return with a six month horizon earns on average 0.82% per month with a T statistic of 3.5 with NYSE and evaluated returns. This estimate is smaller than 1.1% as reported in the paper from Higadosh and Titman, which was the, which was, was the original paper um, that documented first stock price momentum, right? Uh, we reproduce the estimates with all stocks and equal weighted returns, which is closest to the procedure of Higgins and Titman in their or an, um, original sample and obtain 1.18%. Uh, but, but this is not contained in, in the table, however. Uh, this estimate falls to 0.7% in the extended sample. The estimate is 1.06. In the, in the original sample with NYSE stocks and evaluated returns. So that's an interesting finding. If we take next, as next anomaly, the uh, book to market equity, as reported in Rosenberg, Wright, and Lundstein in the 85 paper, yeah, we see that using NYSE stocks and evaluated returns, the average payoff of this uh, anomaly, of this spoke to market ratio anomaly, is 0.54% per month with a T statistic of 2.61. Using NYSE stocks and equal weighted returns, we see the corresponding payoff is much, much higher. It's 1.19% per month with a T statistic of 6.08. This is almost unbelievable. And then you can you can go through here, and what you see is obviously we have high T statistics, yeah, T statistics that are higher than both critical values, 1.96 for the standard significance level, or 2.78 for the T statistic accounting for the multiple testing hurdle. Okay. So if we move move on, if we take the investment to assets. Anomaly, yeah, reported first in Cooper, Gullen, and Schill, 2008 paper. Yeah, so we have a payoff of minus 0.44 with a T statistic of 2.89. Yeah, using NYSE stocks and value weighted returns. Using equal weighted returns, the payoff is much, much higher. It's minus 1, 1%, yeah, minus 1.02% per month with a T statistic of 6.91. Yeah, you see here, the T statistics are much, much higher than both levels, 1.96 or 2.78, yeah? so highly significant. So this anomaly obviously is also uh, able to replicate. Yeah? If you scroll here, you see here everywhere T statistics that are very high, yeah? above five even. So this is, this is very interesting. So obviously, and this actually confirms what we have already seen in figure three because the investment category and the momentum uh, category obviously they they do very well in their replication study now we can move on to the uh, operating profits to book equity as reported in the parman french paper 2015 you remember we spoke in the last lecture about this we discussed about the, the difference between cash profitability and operating profitability here we have the operating profitability 
yeah, using NYSE stocks and value-weighted returns, the average payoff is 0.27, yeah, with a statistic of 1.34. So this anomaly here, or this factor, fails scientific replication, right? If we use equal-weighted returns, the payoff is even lower, which is surprising, right? It should be higher, but this is in this case even lower, and also the t-statistic is even lower. Yeah, it doesn't. It does not even reach the standard significance level of 1.96. Yeah, the t-statistic is 0.66, so it's insignificant. So obviously, this anomaly here, irrespective of which method we choose, yeah, it's insignificant. It fails scientific replication. And in the same manner, we can go through the table. And we can go through this table and we can assess for each anomaly which of these is uh, um, fails replication and which does not fail replication. So that is basically um, the, the outline here of, of this paper. And these are the these were the, the the things that I would like to discuss. So table four we skip uh, this this time. Yeah, here we they talk about principal component analysis, but this is what I would like to skip um, for this lecture. So we discuss the uh, Farmer Macbeth regressions um, in the beginning of of the lecture as a methodology that I consider important for this paper. And if you read other papers, you will uh, encounter this methodology over and over again. So that's why uh, it was worthwhile to discuss that. Moreover, um, this methodology is also applied, of course, in, in, in often in multivariate settings. Uh, we discussed in this lecture the univariate setting. We can, if we just go scroll to that, uh, we can just scroll here. So here, obviously, a similar like what we derived on the on the uh, white board. So in this setting, what that we discussed, we had obviously it was a univariate setting. So we had only one characteristic, uh, and for momentum, you remember it was the cumulative return over a certain time window of of, of past returns that should have predictive power. Yeah? But of course, we can here also have another vector of uh, book to market ratio, yeah, or a vector of uh, profit past profitability, yeah. Then of course we would have a multivariate setting here. I uh, would have a multivariate setting, and accordingly we would have here a vector that has a higher dimension than two point one. Yeah, in this case we would have a vector that has a dimension four point one if we would add here two more characteristics. Yeah, and then we would be interested in obviously. Uh, three risk premiums here. Yeah? This beta one, two, and three in this case. So that's basically um, what I would like uh, to, to talk about um, in, in this lecture here. How to implement Farmer Macbeth regressions is something, it's, it's obviously uh, not doable in eViews to the best of my knowledge, but this is something what I will cover in my quantitative finance course, yeah, there we will learn how to implement uh, farmer Macbeth regressions or, or one one form or one type of farmer Macbeth regressions using uh, MATLAB. Yeah, it's, it's very easy to implement in, in MATLAB using for loops, where we, ba we basically store the results um, in in different uh, result matrices. Yeah, and uh, it's very easy and but we will not uh, go further in, in, into detail uh, in our lecture as of now. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>